Hey Robot Makers, how you doing? I hope you're having a good day so far. So, do you want to see how fast object detection is on the Raspberry Pi 5? Then this is the show for you. So let's let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin. Come with me as we learn. <laughs> Why have I fluffed this up again? Come with me as we learn um, how to build robots, bring them to life with code, and have a whole load of fun along the way. I literally got it written in front of me. I don't know why that was so hard. Okay, let's get straight to it. <laughs> so does anybody recognise the uh, the Python fangirl in today's uh, thumbnail? Comments uh, below if you do know who that is and why that's significant. So yes, today we're going to be learning about how to use CV Zone and Python on the Raspberry Pi 5. I'm just going to my mute my sound a little bit there. Um, we're going to look how to install it very quickly, how to find faces in images and video, how to find hands in video, and also how to detect body posture, which is really cool. Something uh, like you will see on like a Kinect sensor. Remember the Kinect for 360 back in the days on the Xbox? Uh, something like that in software. I'm going to have obviously quite a few demos throughout this as well. And if you're here for the live stream, we'll also do a bit of a mailbox Q&A um, as well. So let's get straight to it, shall we? Okay, so what is CV Zone? So CV Zone is part of the OpenCV uh, library. It's actually a package that you can install onto your computer to do all kinds of computer vision. So it's part of the open source computer vision library that is uh, OpenCV. And it helps you sort of simplify and accelerate your development in computer vision projects. So I've used this on Bubo, which I have just over here. Bubo is uh, undergoing a bit of a renovation at the moment. So um, He's asleep at the moment. He's going to have a new Raspberry Pi 5 in him very shortly so that he can do the computer vision stuff. If you remember, that project is um, you essentially can put a hand gesture in front of Bubo, such as the peace sign. It will count the number of fingers when it's detected a hand, and then it will take a picture if you hold that position for three seconds and then tweet it out. So there's a show on that a while ago if you're interested. So we're going to be using that same technology, which is OpenCV uh, on, on the Python, uh, on the Raspberry Pi 5. So this has some really cool features in it. It makes doing computer vision really, really simple. So it's got this real-time visualization and overlays. These little boxes that you can draw around it kind of come free with the software. It's very easy to use that. Uh, there's landmark detection. We'll have a look at what landmarks are um, in, in the presentation a little bit later on. And it seamlessly integrates with something called MediaPipe, which is like a Google technology for image processing. And uh, it streamlined functions for common tasks in, um, in computer vision. So things like, like I said, counting, how many things you've got, trying to work out what the angle of your arm is and all that kind of stuff makes it really, really, really simple. And it's ideal for enthusiasts, developers and professionals aim uh, aiming for quick and efficient prototyping in computer vision. Really, really easy to get up and running quickly with this. So let's get th through some terminology. So features is something you'll hear a lot in computer vision. And these are distinctive patterns or areas within an image that we're interested in detecting. Uh, these can be things like edges, corners, texture regions. And they use for uh, tasks like image uh, matching, image recognition and tracking as well. So you'll see this quite a lot on modern mobile phone apps um, where you can uh, track where an object is and it'll keep the focus on where the, uh, the, the area of interest is, which typically is like a face or eyes. Then we've got landmarks. So landmarks are specific points of interest within an object or uh, anatomical structure, like a person's body. They can be the corner of the eye, the tip of the nose, joints on the body. I'm doing the Ricky Gervais thing there. Uh, and they're essential for things like pose estimation, facial recognition and motion analysis. So I'm actually working with a company in my day job at the moment where they've got a really cool piece of technology. Uh, so back in the day, you would have like a display screen equipment um, assessment each year where they would sort of come with a clipboard and see, uh, are you sitting completely at your desk with your back sort of straight and your eye line at the top of the monitor and all that kind of stuff and keyboard and mouse and your posture. They can actually capture that posture through the webcam and make kind of recommendations on your posture to avoid back pain. So this is used quite a lot now, um, almost like a day-to-day -day thing behind the scenes. So let's have a look at some computer vision, computer vision models and um, some aspects of that. So we'll look at classification, detection, and segmentation. These are three very different areas. Uh, sometimes they'll get uh, bundled together in an object detection um, a library. So segmentation is about separating out different things. So things like uh, what you can see in an image, like a house, a tree, uh, might be a background. So background removal in Microsoft Teams or Zoom or 
Skype if you still use that. That can use segmentation to separate you out from the background. We have classification, so you can actually detect an object within a scene and give it a label, a predefined label such as an animal or tree. Uh, you'll see this like if you use like an iPhone or an Android phone and you're searching for say a dog in your photo library and it can find a picture of all the dogs and that labeling is done automatically in the background through classification. And then detection is where you can say within an image where is that particular object or thing that we're interested in such as a house or a tree and it'll give you the x and y coordinates within the image of where they are and you can draw a little bounding box around that so that can be useful for uh, focusing on things or particularly if you have like a camera that is on um, a little um, gimbal a little arm it can actually track where an object is and move the uh, the camera left or right up and down to track the uh, the object in the scene so Object detection is a combination of these things. We, we want to do localization and identification. Um, we want to combine those things together. So object detection is a branch of computer vision that deals with localization and identification of an object. Uh, and it combines those two tasks together uh, to achieve single goal of object detection. So localization deals with specifying the location within the object is within the, the image or video stream and identification deals with assigning the object a specific label class or description. So image processing, how it actually works behind the scenes, because sometimes this stuff just works like magic and you might not actually understand how does it actually work behind the scenes. And it's um, there's a number of different steps to it. So first of all, we take a picture with our camera and that picture is made up of a number of different pixels. Um, a typical resolution, you know, might be like a 1080p, so a 1920 by 1080 pixels. And they might be um, a, a byte per color. So you have those three bytes that make up the RGB red green and blue values so for each pixel within the, uh, the the image that you're looking at you'll have red green and blue value and that's stored as a single pixel value now in image processing if we're doing things like object detection quite a lot of the time we're not actually interested in the color at all so one of the first steps is to actually make that image grayscale, remove all the uh, the color from that. And you've then got an image that's a third the size of the original one. And we've actually got rid of all the information that we don't need, which makes it quicker to process and uses less memory and processing power. The next thing we do once we've got that grayscale image is we will essentially treat it as a very long array. So when we think about an image as a human, we think about the whole picture and we perceive it uh, all at once. Whereas in computer vision, computers don't really understand images, they just understand numbers. So if we have those numbers um, in a very long array, and essentially what we do is we take each one of those rows of pixels and we just stack them all next to each other and have just a great big uh, array of grayscale values, which are typically a value between 0 and 255, or sometimes they'll be normalized to be a value between 0 and 1. So all the different values between that. <coughs> So the next step then is we take that array of pixels um, and each one of those different um, numbers within it obviously represents the pixels and it's just a value between 0 and 255, like I said, which is one byte um, in uh, of memory. Now there's a couple of different types of way of processing it now as a next step. So we can do something that's called a Haar cascade. We'll have a look at what a Haar cascade is in a minute. Uh, and that's a type of machine learning object detection method, uh, but it's very, very simplistic. It's essentially just detecting features within an image and looking at does a, a particular feature exist and then does another feature exist? And you kind of build up all those different features uh, to detect something like a face or, or a hand, for example, or where that is within the image. Uh, and it's really, really fast at doing this. It doesn't use deep learning, which we'll uh, look at maybe in a, a di different video in the future. We have looked at deep learning uh, with the Jetson Nano. We did a, a video where we actually trained a model in real time, a number of different models. We took a hundred different pictures, drew rectangles around each object to train, create a training set. And then we ran it through the, uh, the, the, the learning model. And then it could actually detect in real time those new objects that we'd uh, put on screen. So this one, we're not going to do that. We're going to use like a pre-trained pre model and it's going to be based on this Haar cascade technique. So it uses something called an integral image. We'll have a look at what that is in a minute, uh, which is really, really fast for um, detecting features and it doesn't actually require that much computation, surprisingly. And it employs this uh, cascade of classifiers for rapid object detection. And um, we'll have a look at what that means on the next slide. 
and, and like I said, it's really, really fast for real time applications such as what we're going to be looking at today, where we can move our hands around or look at our face in real time on the Raspberry Pi 5. It requires a lot less computational resources than if you, ha you know, manually did this. Um, and um, it has limited accuracy and robustness compared to like a deep learning model. And uh, yeah, the depending on what the lighting is and uh, we'll have a see when we actually have go go live with the demo in a minute how it handles the studio lighting i may need to switch off temporarily uh, because this is one of the drawbacks with this method and it's trained um, for specific object detection and therefore it's not very generalized uh, it can't be easily expanded um, so you'd have to essentially train that model again whereas the deep learning ones tends to be um, a lot more uh, general but they can use specific um, specialized hardware to achieve that goal such as the jetson nano so we'll not really look at the deep learning stuff today, so I'll, I'll skip that uh, for today. So yes, and the deep learning method uses these uh, neural networks. So essentially we take all those pixels which are represented in that column of numbers there, and we feed that into the input layers of our neural network. The hidden layers do their magic stuff, and what you get out is, uh, yes, there's a hand in this, and this is where it is in the image, uh, or, or whatever you've trained it for. But like I said, we'll look at that in a future video potentially. <laughs> he says that and then there's another slide about neural networks so this was just a bit more detail about how actually neural networks um, calculate from the inputs they have weights and they have outputs uh, and essentially what we do is just take those inputs um, multiply them by the weights that we have and then we add all the values together and then normalize that with something called a sigmoid function which just basically makes it between a, a number between zero and one in a in a consistent way don't worry about that today we're just going to be looking at um, har cascades here we go so ha, Alfred Ha um, was a sort of mathematician and uh, he came up with this mathematical sequence uh, for reducing um, the complexity of images in, in a sort of reliable way. He actually did it um, as more of a pure mathematical way for creating these wave ha, um, ha wavelets. Um, and essentially what happens with a ha cascade is we find a feature. So we might say, if we're detecting a face, um, we might look at a, a, a picture of a face and you might say, right, let's generalize this. The eye area is darker than the surrounding area. So we've got these sort of dark patches here. And then if we look at it as a sort of strip down there, there's like a white strip down there compared to the other sides. So there are two features we could look for. We could look for um, some dark areas and then a, a white area down the middle. And that could be a face that's looking at us straight on. So we, if we break that down into features, the first feature being, let's look for dark, light, dark for the eyes, uh, eye, dark, dark, light, dark. That's the first feature. If we're scanning an image and we, we find that, we can then say, right, we might have a face here. Let's see if there's a nose connected to that. So let's see if there's a, a white strip very close to these uh, dark eyes in, in between them. If we find that, we might then look and see, is there a mouth area? And look for a sort of a, a line or an edge detection there. So this sequence of... Um, features that we're looking for is the cascade so the reason it's fast is because if we don't find the first one we don't have to test for all the other features and therefore it makes it very quick to do this scanning through all the pi all the pixels so it's very very quick um, because if that window of uh, features fails it's discarded and it goes to the next one to see uh, is there something in that one to check for only windows that pass all the stages are deemed to contain the object that we're looking for such as the face so that's what a hard cascade is so like I said with the, uh, the example I was giving there, we're going to look for a number of features that we want to detect, such as the, uh, the eyes and the nose. If we find the, uh, the eyes area that are darker than the rest of the face, we can then test to see is there a nose within this particular window. If there is, we can probably say that there's maybe a face in that particular image. And there's a few different things we can search for there. There is the edges, there's lines, and there's these four rectangular uh, features. And they're as simple as that. That's that's really all we're looking for in these hard cascades. Just very, very simple features. And it's the combination of them that makes up something like a face or a hand uh, or whatever. So let's have a deep dive in how this actually works behind the scenes. So the feature detection works by adding up all the values in one area. So the area under the, the dark side of this uh, image, this feature that we're looking for, so the black area. Uh, and then we compare that to the sum of all the pixels in the white area. Uh, and if we if, if the white area is uh, has a higher 
account to them the the, uh, the darker area then we can say that that feature has been found so that's all we need to be able to do now one of the problems with that is imagine you've got a picture that's a 4k picture so it's 3000 odd pixels by what is it 2000 odd pixels so it's a very very large image if we wanted to scan through that entire image pixel by pixel to try and find every feature that's possible in there we'd be there for a very long time for a 24 pixel by 24 pixel grid that would mean there are 180,000 possible features to test for uh, computers are fast but they're not that fast that would take a lot of processing power and that's just for the first feature so we can optimize this uh, in a quite an intelligent way using integral images uh, we're going to have a look at that in a second so this uh, algorithm the hard cascade one like i said checks for the first um, feature if it doesn't find that it, it goes to the next window and tries again if it finds that feature it then goes to the next feature to detect for within that window and then if it finds that it goes to the next one and then it can declare that it's found that particular feature that you're looking for if not it just goes to the next window so it makes it very very fast to, to scan through all the possibilities so this integral image is um, if we think about this is our original image on the right hand side uh, it's um, an array of pixel values between say 0 and 255 our grayscale image and it'll be one pixel will be one of these uh, cells in here so we would have potentially thousands of them across there so if our image is in this example an array of eight by eight pixels uh, each with a value of zero between uh, between zero and two five five i think that's more than eight by eight that looks like it's ten by eight um, you could just ignore the last two columns for example on there but that's what our original image would look like if we were to sort of draw out all the different values so what we want to do now is create an integral image so this is very different an algorithm is going to produce um, it's going to calculate the value of a particular section of the screen it's going to add up all the different values within this sort of area and then it's going to store the value of that the sum of that in one of the cells and it's easier to actually see this in action rather than explain it um, in a dry way so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to have a test of this so these cells in this integral image are not pixels they're actually the, um, they can be much larger than pixels so one cell might actually um, contain a hundred pixels for example hundred by hundred so it could have a thousand pixels in it for example it's just arbitrary we can decide how many of these cells there are and by specifying how many cells there are we can define like the the quality of the detection and we can also reduce down the amount of time we can actually dial up and down how fast our algorithm is using this technique so it's really really smart for that so each cell isn't a pixel it's the sum of all the values in the corresponding area of the original image and to calculate its value you go to the pixel of the in the original image that this corresponds to and then you draw a line from the bottom right to the top left from that point so let's do that we're going to draw a line there and we're going to shade in um, this is our original image now we're going to shade in all the areas there just so we can understand what's going on and we're basically just going to add up every single one of those pixel values in there and then we're going to store that in that bottom right uh, of our integral image go back to our integral image the value there is 51 we're going to store that there we're going to do that with another area now so let's just arbitrarily pick another one we're going to show shade in these values from our um, original picture just so we can see them so this is now our, our original one we're going to add up all those values and we're going to store that in that uh, in our integral image so that's now 80 and we're going to do this for the rest of our integral image we're going to add up the values of all the different rectangles that we can draw in there we're quite quick to do that computers are really good at do adding numbers together so this is really fast and we only need to do this once per image and the cell in the integral image corresponds to a specific area within the original image and this is where the magic will start to happen so the value of that cell again is the sum of all the values in the corresponding area to that original image so this is our our our, uh, our integral image completed you can see that it kind of goes um, up in value as we we start to add more and more values in more and more uh, overlapping rectangles so let's go back to our original image and we want to detect some features within here so the way that we do that within integral image is we're going to say right so this is a five by three pixel grid um, and it just has 15 numbers that we need to add up so if this um, had, had a 100 by 100 or a 1000 by 1000 doesn't actually matter because our integral image will still be the same it's because it's it's scalable we don't actually have to use the number of pixels within that particular window area so what we're going to do now is we're going to sort of say right let's go back to our integral image and look at that value 215 uh, we're going to remember that number and then we need to take away the numbers above outside of this um, um, 
selected area. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the, uh, the sum of the, uh, the area of the rectangle that's outside of that is 80. We can see there. But we also need to get rid of the bit on the, the left hand side there as well. So we're going to draw another little box there. So that's 20. And then we're going to no draw another one which is just from the top to the bottom there which is uh, 72. And then we simply just subtract those numbers away from um, our original number and we end up with um, a value. So that's how we figure out when we were saying before about having a black area and a white area that we want to detect. Is it, uh, is it higher than the, uh, the other number? So is the, the black area uh, higher or lower than the white area? This is how we can figure it out. We've essentially just got four numbers to look at rather than thousands of calculations. It's much, much quicker to do this. So we can do this many, many different times. So if you like the content that I create, um, pre please consider liking this video, dropping a comment uh, and also subscribing to the channel if you've not already subscribed. Now, quite a few people have come over from uh, Chris's channel today because they've seen me sort of on the Teams call when I had a chat with him. So uh, yes, if you've not subscribed to the channel, I'd really appreciate that. Check out some of the other videos as well, of course, if you want to see uh, some of the other stuff that I do. And I do go live every single Sunday at 7 p.m. Uh, UK local time. So we're currently um, at 7 o'clock. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time plus one, which is British summer time. But I think at the end of this month, it goes back to uh, GMT. OK, so there are loads of different Har Cascade models that have been predefined for us. They're all in these XML files. We don't actually have to worry about that. If we do, if we're using OpenCV, I think you actually have to point it out which particular model that you want to use. But if you're using CV zone, you don't have to worry about that at all. It already knows about it. And you can see some of the things we've got on there. We've got like an eye detection. We've got eyes with glasses on, we've got uh, frontal face, we have frontal face alternative views, full body, um, eye two split so it can separate the eyes out, lower body, um, left ear, right ear, mouth, we can all kinds of different specific detection uh, pre-trained models for us. You've even got smiles, you can see if you're smiling or if you're sad, uh, just have to demonstrate that just in case you don't know what that means. <laughs> Anyways. So the pros and cons with the Cascade model is speed is the definite pro. It's very, very, very fast. The cons are accuracy, but we can dial this up and down um, depending on what the size of that integral image is. Um, and obviously that also affects how fast um, it can do the, uh, the checking for models. It's also quite limited, like I said. So training is, spe is speci specific to a particular object type, not generalized very well. So you can detect a hand, but the hand detection isn't great detecting faces. You have to use one or the other. You have to look for a very specific thing. And deep learning can probably combine exactly what you're looking for, but there's a, there's a cost there from a processing point of view. It's not quite as fast as this. And you can see they've got edge features, line features, and center surround features as well, like the eye. So, Deep learning, on the other hand, um, this is a subset of machine learning that uses neural networks with many layers, hence the name Deep. And these networks can uh, learn to make independent decisions um, by training on vast amounts of data. So for face detection, we can um, it's more robust. We can make, make it um, detect lots of different types of faces, young, old faces, um, faces all different kinds of shapes and in different kinds of lighting conditions. So if it's a side profile, that um, deep learning is great for doing all that kind of stuff. If it's got hats on, you've got masks on, it uh, works great for all that kind of stuff. And unlike Har Cascades, which uses these predefined features, deep learning can be automatically learn um, new features just by adding some extra training data to that. So the self-learning attribute makes, them, makes it a game changer, as they say. And it's much more flexible um, to, uh, and it could be fine-tuned as well. So... Har Cascade is great because it's fast. Deep learning is if you want the accuracy there and you've got the processing power. OK, so let's check out CV Zone. So I've got um, a Raspberry Pi 5 ready to go. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to go back to and there, it, there it is on the table there, just uh, waiting to go. We've not got the fan on yet because it's uh, uh, it's not doing very much at the moment. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect to it by VNC. So if I jump over here, um, I'm connected by VNC. Now, VNC uses X Windows. Uh, so you're not getting the full power of the, the new Wayland interface on this, but um, it's fine. It works well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code and then we'll talk through what each line of the code does. Because there isn't actually that many lines of code. There's more comments than anything else. So let's run this and actually get a feel for what this is going to do. So this is hand um, hand gesture recognition. So there we go. So this is running on the Raspberry Pi 5. You can see that it's pretty, pretty fast. If I, uh, if I move around, if you if you wave your hand up in the air, Alex, as well, let's see if it can detect your hand from the back. 
maybe it's uh, not quite been able to detect that. But if you put it more towards me, let's see if it detects it. There you go, detecting hand. I think it's actually that I've got it set to detect just two hands. So if I'm holding both up, um, it drops any other recognition there. There's also a blue number just up there. And what that's doing is it's counting how many fingers I've got uh, up. So if I hold my hand up like this and then I put my thumb in and I drop my thumbs in and I drop my fingers in like so you can see that the number is counting down. I've got one little pinky and then I can drop that in. So I can actually detect left and right hand and which fingers I'm actually holding up, which is pretty cool. And this is the test program I wrote for, for Bubo for detecting like is are you doing the sort of peace sign? I think there's a very specific way you have to do it and then it'll uh, detect that it's there. So that's uh, that's the code and that's what it can do. So you can see the landmarks in there. You can see each of these little red dots uh, and the they're all connected together. It can detect where the different joints are in my fingers and it can even detect if I'm actually holding up a finger or not. Uh, it's not great at doing that from all different angles. It can sort of get a bit confused if it can't quite make them out, but it's doing a pretty good job. I think they're actually mapping things. It's quite uh, quite magical to see that. And the bounding boxes are being drawn in real time as well. We can have a look at the uh, the Python code that does that. You can see there, um, if I overlap them, it kind of gets a bit confused there. But you can, uh, you can make out what's going on. Right, so let's uh, stop that code. You can see how quick that was on the Raspberry Pi 5. Uh, so let's have a look at the actual code. Hopefully you can see that okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna install CV Zone. So CV Zone is pretty simple to install. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna jump over to Kev's Robots and show you the new course that I've created uh, this weekend. Um, so if I go to, in fact, let me go to, um, a local server rather than the uh, I don't want all the adverts to pop up on this one so what I will do I will just go to a local server there we go and let me just bring this up on screen so you can see it okay right so this is kevsrobots.com um, normally you would just see the uh, kevsrobots.com but this is uh, my local access to it and if we go to the uh, the free courses and the computer vision the first thing that's on here is how to install CV Zone. So it's actually pretty simple to install. Uh, all we need to do, we need a Raspberry Pi. You can use a Raspberry Pi 4 or a Raspberry Pi 5 to do this. And we just need to do sudo apt-get update. That will just bring all the latest packages and update your uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, we can then do um, sudo apt-get install libopencv-dev and python3-opencv. Uh, that will bring in all the OpenCV libraries. And then to install CV Zone, we simply do pip3 install CV Zone. And then that's it. It's as simple as that. Now, this will work with a USB web camera. That's what I'm currently using on the, um, the Raspberry Pi. It's got, um, I think it's a Microsoft Live camera, something like that. Um, it's like a 1080p camera. And uh, you can also use the Raspberry Pi's cameras as well. It can actually use two cameras on the new Raspberry Pi. You can actually have two sessions of this running at the same time maybe one detecting faces and one detecting hands and that'll work fine so uh, i've been using these uh little raspberry pi um cameras as well i've got the uh, the original one there and also the new uh camera three mod module three with the auto focus on there as well okay so let's uh, go back to um the raspberry pi itself let's go back over and have a look at some of the codes if i jump over here so now we've installed the software, we can simply create this kind of program. So from cvzone.hand tracking module, import hand detector. So you can probably guess what that's going to do. That's going to create a class uh, that we can use that's called hand detector. We're also going to import CV2, and that's the computer vision open CV library. What we then need to do is capture from our video camera uh, a variable, uh, and that will that will essentially take um, a single picture each time uh, one one, one for each frame of video that we can bring in. So cap equals CV two dot video capture. And then the zero there is just which, which is the number of the camera that you're using. So if you want to see what kind of cameras you've got installed, you can do, um, I think it's called lib camera test. Let's just go and type that down here. Lib camera, hello, um, oops, hello list cameras, I think it is. 
so we've got no cameras available and that's for testing the the built-in raspberry pi cameras if so if you've got two cameras you'd see two cameras listed there but because i've actually not got any of those plugged in right now um, it's showing zero i'm actually using the uh, the web camera and when you plug a web camera into usb it just essentially pr uh, provides a um, um, if you go to dev slash uh, video zero, I think it is. Um, let's just do ls dev v star. Oops. Dev v star. And uh, we just make this a bit bigger. We can see all the different devices we've got there. And video zero is essentially the web camera. So that's that's what we actually see. Um, that's how the USB camera presents itself in Unix. Anyway, so that's going to... That's going to capture um, a current frame. And uh, what we then need to do is, is use our detector. So we say detect equals hand detector and then detection con equals 0 0.5. Maximum hands is two. That's the variable we need to change. Let's change that to four. Uh, and let's actually run this code again. So Alex, if you want to wave your hand in the air now, let's see if you can get it to detect. So if you need to be a bit closer, there we go. So Alex has got one and it's detected as a left hand. And there we go, I've got uh, a few hands going on there. That's working fine. Thank you for that, Alex. Okay. So we can actually dial in how many hands we want it to detect. But obviously, the more that we detect, the slower it will go. So I'm just going for two hands at the moment. Uh, and this detection con is just like a dial to say how accurate do you want that to be? What's the threshold where it detects a hand or not? So 0 0.5 is like just between 0 and 1. So um, it's just in between there. Now we've got another uh, loop here. The while true um, is essentially just going to run until we, we crash the program out with the command uh, control C. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is grab the, the current frame. So we want to get the image frame. So we say success comma image equals cap dot read. So cap is our video capture, if you remember, and it's going to put success as either true or false. Uh, An image will contain the actual image ready to be detected. OK, so let's move a bit further down. There's some commented out stuff here we don't need to worry about. I'm actually going to count the number of fingers that can be seen here. So I'm going to say total fingers equals zero. And then we're going to use that hand detector to actually detect in the variable that's called hands. Uh, and the image that we've uh, passed in, we're just going to pass that back in there. And um, we say detector.find hands image. And um, it says there in the comment withdraw that's going to draw that bounding box around the hand that it finds so we don't actually have to tell it to do that you actually have to tell it not to do that by saying draw equals false so if we put draw equals false on there you wouldn't get that rectangle around the hand i'm also trying to detect gestures now gestures is just something I, i've made up that that peace sign is essentially it's going to count the fingers on one of your hands you can even specify which hand you want to count the fingers on uh, and it can detect whether it's um, uh, finger one or two i seem to have frozen on screen again there i'm not sure what's going on i think it's the uh, the version of the software i'm using is uh, got a bit of a bug in it so it's going to unplug my camera and just let that plug back in for a second but hopefully it can still hear me there and i should pop back on any moment now as it uh, detects me again <laughs> ironic that we're doing a, a video about uh, face detection okay so then if if hands is, is but it says if hands what that's really saying is if hands is uh, true so there is a um, more that there is a hand detected in the image then we can then scroll down to the next uh, bit of code so we can say hand one equals hand zero and it, it just means the first hand that it's detected we can then do like a landmark um, um, we can create a variable for detecting landmark so lm list one is just the landmarks for hand one we're going to call that uh, lm list um, and then we're then going to say b box which is just short for bounding box um, equals hand one b box so draw a bounding box uh, and get the info um, from that the x y width and height and then the center point is just the center of the hand so we want to get that particular x and y coordinate there as well and then we can even say, what's the hand type? Is it a left hand or is it a right hand? So ha hand type one equals hand one type. So is it a left or right hand? I've then got this thing that says fingers one equals detected dot fingers up. So remember before I was actually demonstrating it could count how many fingers are up and how many are down. Uh, that's something that we can test for in OpenCV, CV zone. So we pass it the hand that we want to detect there. And I just set that gestures back to zero. I then count the number of fingers that are up. And this is the down or up. 
So total fingers equals the sum of fingers detected. And if the fingers, and this is literally how you can say which finger on the hand it is. So I want to do the peace sign. Um, so I think the thumb is first and then you've got the, the other fingers there. That's a very weird effect that happened on the screen then. <laughs> Let me, uh, un oh, I'm going to say this is going to be a bit frustrating this for me, I think, on this stream using that particular camera. Anyway, so uh, yes, the, we can actually detect in this particular um, array here uh, which fingers it is that we are holding up. Um, and what that particular sequence of um, numbers there means is the peace sign. We've got the thumbs up as well. I think this was uh, Apple trying to do some clever stuff with uh, if it detects. Yeah, you see there it's got like the little thumb up thing. That's Apple's uh, FaceTime trying to be clever. I think it's actually getting in the way of my live stream. <laughs> So yes, anyway, and th these are the gestures essentially. So uh, the gesture is either P's, thumbs up, or what it's calling four. If it can detect four fingers are up, it'll just say four as the uh, the gesture. And then we can then say if um, if length of hands equals two, so there's two hands detected, it essentially does the same thing on the other hand with the variables just ending in two. So we can do the exact same thing there. Right, and then we can say finger count equals the string of total numbers. So that's an integer. We're just going to cast it into a string. And then we're going to put that string on screen on our image using the cv2.putText. So this is a way of just drawing text onto our image overlay. Uh, so we pass in the image. We pass in the, the text that we want to display. So this is in gesture. So it'll say peace sign or thumbs up or whatever. Uh, we then pass the um, this 410215 I think is where it displays um, within the, the actual uh, XY coordinates. The font that we want to use, we've got this font Hershey Plain and then we have, um, um, I think 4 is like the font size and then we have like the RGB values of the actual font that it's using and then we've got a value 6, I can't even remember what 6 is there. We do that for gesture, we do that for finger count, and then we do image show. So image show is the thing that actually displays it uh, in the little window on screen. It says wait key there. I think if you press the, like the Q key or something like that, it will um, it will detect that and you can make the program close. And then the last two statements we've got there, which actually never get reached. Cap.release just releases the video capture device um, and cv2.destroy all windows. <laughs> Sounds like really evil that. That simply just uh, collapses any X windows that are open at the time. So if we run that again, we can see uh, just what's going on. So you can see that that right and the bounding box, that's um, that image being drawn. So if we go to our code and we, we comment out, uh, let's go up to the top there. If we put in there, draw equals false, and we just restart this code. Just have to stop it and start it again. And now I hold my hand up. It's now not drawing the bounding box. It's still detecting stuff because you can see up there and that blue thing, you can get it to do like the counting four fingers. You can get it to do the, the peace sign, I think. Is it that way around? Sometimes it detects it as the, the, wrong, the wrong fingers. Uh, and then we can do like the thumbs up. I have to do it from a particular angle. I'm not sure. It's getting a bit confused on the, on the, the finger count there. You get the idea anyway. I've not really tested my code to be fair on that particular one. Right, so that's how we do that. We can comment that back out again so that we uh, we actually see the bounding box on the screen. So save that. So that's how we do hand detection. It's really quite clever. You can do all kinds of clever things with this in your code uh, and you can bring all kinds of contactless control of stuff. So you can maybe make a gesture where you, you wave your hand or you do a particular gesture and uh, it can detect that and then you can make your code act upon that. Right, so let's get back to our keynote for a second. And uh, let's see what we're going to be looking at next. So, so we did hand detection. Was that face detection was the first one? So let's go and do face detection now. So let's go back to uh, uh, our Raspberry Pi and let's do some face detection. So I've got another piece of code here. This one's much simpler. It's just those lines you can see there. So from CV zone, import face detection module. And then we import CV2. And then we do the video capture thing again. And then we simply say face detector equals face detection module dot face detector. And that's going to detect our face. And then we simply do while true, we do the same thing before success, um, comma image equals cap read. That's going to read the capture device uh, and store the value in the image. And the success is just true or false, whether it worked or not. The reason it might fail is if you're using your camera on a different session, uh, only one thing can use the image capture device at a time. 
Uh, then with CV2 image show, face detection, and then the image, and then it's simply going to wait for the Q key to break out of that. So let's run this code and see what happens. So it's going to pop up my face there, and it's it's 90, 80 percent certain that that's actually a face. Maybe it gets more more comfortable if I sort of turn slightly. You'll see that at some point it'll drop out and not detect it. Let's see if it detects Alex's face. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's not detecting your face there. I don't know if I've, I've, I've limited it to a number of faces. I don't think I have, actually. Uh, so, yeah, that will uh, detect faces, and it will carry on doing that all the time. So I don't know if I've got a picture of a face. It would be interesting to see if I, uh, if I got a robot or something like that. Would it detect that as a face? I'm going to try and grab that by the eye holes. That's usually the easier way. Let's see if it can detect this. <laughs> so when I walk away, it can't detect it. Let's go and bring this into view and see, does it detect this as a face? Is this a face? It kind of is a face. It's sort of getting a bit confused though, isn't it? Look, it can just about... It might be that the camera is too bright on it. So what the, uh, the studio lights are too bright. So what I'll do, I'll just turn the camera, the studio lights down. There we go. I think there was too much white bouncing off there. My face detection has improved as well somewhat. So you can see there. It's detecting both of our faces pretty quickly in real time. But if I put the studio lights back on, there's too much white bouncing off this and it's uh, finding it harder to detect that. Okay, so I'm just going to put that down over there for a second <laughs> without dropping it. Okay, so let's um, let's go back over to our, our keynote and there's an extra one that we need to look at now, which is posture estimation. So... CV Zone can do posture estimation, which is pretty cool, pose estimation. And it's got a number of different landmarks that it can detect. So it can detect your nose, the left inner eye, which is there, I guess, the eye, and then the outer eye, same on the other side, left ear, right ear, mouth left, mouth right, shoulder left, shoulder right, elbows, wrists, <laughs> pinkies, uh, thumbs, hips, knees, excuse me, ankles, heels, and feet. And that little diagram I've got there that shows you kind of where they are. And that's exactly what it looks like. Now, it can just give you back uh, an X and Y coordinate between these landmarks. And you can also ask it to work out what the angle is. So on this next piece of code, I've asked it to calculate the angle between, um, I think, my, my wrist and my shoulder, I think. So let's go and run that. Let's go back over to, um, to the Raspberry Pi there. Let's just cancel this out. Okay, there we go. And let's go back over to, well, not back over, let's go to posture. I'll run the code and then we'll have a look through. But you can see it's not too difficult uh, to follow this one. There's more comments than there is actual co code in there. Right, here we go. <laughs> so this looks a bit weird as an overlay. But you can see there, it's detecting um, those landmarks. You can see my eyes there, my nose, my mouth. And then look, if I hold up this one here, it looks like I've got like a... Um, some kind of elastic band between my wrist and my my shoulder and that angle there is the actual angle uh, of that so if i try and get it at 90 degrees let's see if i can get it to do that there you go so it's like a right angle so you can see um, just this angle here that's what it's trying to calculate so it's pretty cool that isn't it and if i get up and move to the back of the studio for a second with the chair out the way You can see the whole effect there. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, and it's doing this in real time. It's uh, moving around pretty quickly. Not sure about the pinkies. I don't think it's quite got those right. It just seems to be like an area within my palm. Again, let's turn off the studio lights and see if it gets any better at detecting that. Um, it's probably a bit easier to see on the screen there. But it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I quite like this. And it's drawing an entire bounding box around my body as well. Let's put those lights back up there too. Cool. So let's have a look at the actual code itself and see what's actually going on there. Uh, so let's just cancel out, out of that. Okay, so similar to the hand and the face um, detector, we say from cvzone.pose module, import pose detector, import cv2, just like we have done before. We're going to read in, we're going to capture the video capture device on uh, camera zero. Now this detector has got a few more options in here because obviously this pose uh, estimation has got a lot more levers and switches. So detector equals pose detector, static mode equals false, model complexity equals one, 
smooth landmarks is true, enable segmentation false, smooth segmentation true, detection con 0.5 and tracking con 0.5. So these are all different things that you can turn on and off or just create a value between 0 and 1 to, to dial in exactly how you want this to work. Then we've got this uh, while true loop like we had before. So success equal um, success and image equals capture.read. So that's going to read the current frame. Um, image detector image equals detector.find pose image. That's going to find within our image is there is there a pose to be detected? Detect, is there a pose to be detected? We're then going to have a landmarks list, a bounding box info. Uh, I'm going to basically say detector.find position using that image. Draw equals true, so it is going to draw that bounding box around me. And then we've got this other thing on here that says uh, B box with hands is false. So a bounding box with hands. Let's turn that to true and see what happens actually. So if we do true on there and just run our code, and if we actually get like a bounding box around each hand, um, don't seem to have, I'm not sure what extra value that, that adds. Yeah, very weird. Okay, let's, uh, let's cancel that. Um, so that's the detection. Uh, let's just scroll to the left there. Uh, and then we say if landmark list, so if there are some landmarks to be detected, then we say center equals bounding box info center. So that's the center of the bounding box where my that center of my body is. CV.circle image center five, and then the colors, and then filled. So draw a circle at the center of the bounding box. So that's those red dots, I think, that we could see there. Um, so let's go down to the next bit. Calculate the distance between the landmarks 11 and landmarks 15. So landmark 11, let's have a look on our list here, left shoulder and left wrist. So these are the landmarks, my little landmarks um, uh, lookup table there. Let me just go back to the uh, Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to do the same with uh, the angle um, is going to be drawn out. So that angle I tried to get to 90 degrees. So we're going to say find the angle uh, and then we pass in the actual landmarks that we're interested in. So 11, 13 and 15. And this um, 0 to 2, um, I'm not actually 100% sure what that is, but I think it's just a, another dial we can we can mess with. We can look at that. All the documentation is on the uh, OpenCV uh, documentation page on the internet. So you can actually look and see how does this find angle detector work if you want to know more about that. Uh, and then there's a scale factor and a color as well. And then we can say check if the angle is close to 50 degrees with an offset of 10 uh, and we can basically just say if that's true or false and if we run this code and you look at the little output down here in this little window and i try and move my my arm on this one wasn't it uh, and get it to be less than 50 was it so you can see they're true or false so i can get it to 50 and not 50. so using that i could detect a wave <laughs> I could basically get it to detect am i waving is it oscillating between true and false within a, a certain time frame so all kinds of gestures and things you can you can create just using these very simple um fine angles and angle checks and so on we simply just check we we'll print that uh, check results to the screen so we simply just say uh, print and then is angle close um to 50 which is what that uh, variable there is and It'll print that to the screen, to the terminal, and then CV the image dot show image, and then image just displays that frame to the uh, the X window window. Wait key will simply just wait um, a millisecond between each frame. Uh, we can actually turn that off and get um, the the code to run a bit faster. I suspect. Um, okay, so that's how we do the uh, the posture detection. Uh, there we go, the posture detection. So let's go back to our keynote see what we've got next for you. So we've looked at the CV um, zone pose estimation. So I've got a quick message from my sponsor now. I just need to uh, share this with you. So thanks to PCB, PCB Way for sponsoring this video. I really do appreciate the support. This video is sponsored by PCB Way, your ultimate destination for all things PCB manufacturing and assembly. Whether you're a hobbyist, a startup or a seasoned professional, PCB Way has got you covered. PCB Way offers an impressive range of services. 
They provide high quality custom design printed circuit boards for any application you can imagine. From single layer to multi layer, flexible and even rigid flex PCBs. They have the expertise to bring your designs to life. PCB Way ensures fast turnaround times and affordable prices without compromising on quality. With their state of the art facilities and advanced manufacturing techniques, they can handle small prototype orders up to large scale production runs with equal precision and efficiency. PCB Way offers additional value added services such as PCB assembly, component sourcing, and even functional testing. You can trust them to deliver the fully assembled and tested boards ready for integration into your projects. One of the best parts of PCB Way is their user friendly online platform. It allows you to easily upload your designs, get in instant quotes and track the progress of your orders in real time. Plus their dedicated customer support team are ready to assist you with any questions or concerns. So whether you're working on an innovative Internet of Things device, a robotics project or anything in between, PCB Way is your go-to partner for reliable and affordable PCB manufacturing and assembly. Head over to PCBWay.com today and turn your ideas into reality with PCB Way, your trusted PCB manufacturing and assembly partner. Okay, thanks again to uh, PCB Way for sponsoring the show today. Okay, so let's have a look what else we've got for you. So have you checked out the learning platform on kevsrobots.com? So I showed you one of the, the new courses that I created this weekend, which is the OpenCV uh, course, completely free. There's no kind of sign up or anything required. Just go to the web page and you'll get uh, learning straight away. So there's all kinds of examples, videos, such as today's video will be part of the new OpenCV course there. Excuse me, and there's quite a few other things burping on screen that's terrible let me go back to um here and show you what some of the other courses quickly look like so i've got learning pathways so there's um if you want to learn how to get started in robotics there's a number of different courses um, that make up that learning pathway so robotics 101 python for beginners learn micropython the basics you can go then um, a bit further on and learn about micropython and gpio pins you can look at how I created the I mechanism and also the new course, which we're going through today, which is the computer vision course. So there's all these different courses there. And uh, yeah, you can pick like a, a different learning pathway such as learn Python. So you've got Python for beginners, MicroPython basics, the GPIO, and also the computer vision one. Um, you've also got some other ones like 3D design, such as uh, how to use Fusion 360, how to design a robot eye mechanism and so on. So check that out, it's completely free. You simply just go into the course and then away you go. No sign up or anything required, all completely for free. So that is um, the learning platform. So check it out by going to kesrobots.com slash learn forward slash and get learning today. We also have some merch. So I've got a number of different hats um, available. These are essential for winter keeping your head warm <laughs> but also just to show the fact that you're a, a robot maker to other people so i was wearing my hat uh, when i was on holiday in italy uh, and the next table i could see that there's this woman sort of me more into her husband sort of saying that guy something to do with robots uh, anyway after they would finished eating the meal he said so you build robots and he was um one of the people that worked on um what's the is it da vinci i think it's called which is a medical robot that can do all kinds of clever medical stuff he was working on that and uh, i got talking to him just because i was wearing my hat so it's a way of finding other robot makers out there uh, so why not get one of those today we also have like mugs and uh, t-shirts and all kinds of stuff so check that out at kevsrobots.com slash merch. We're also on Discord. If you've not joined our Discord server, you can head over to there completely for free. Just go to kevsrobots.com slash Discord and you'll get emailed a link uh, when you just uh, provide your email address. And you can follow me on social media. I am all over social media. So I'm on uh, threads uh, at kevmacalier at threads.net. I'm on TikTok at kevmacalier6. I've not been very consistent with my naming on here. Um, I'm at kevmacalier on Instagram. I'm also at KevsMac on X. I hate seeing that. <laughs> Twitter was so much better as a name, wasn't it? Um, at KevsMac at Macedon.social. And I'm also at KevsMac on Blue Sky Social as well. So if you're on any of those platforms, say hi and uh, I'll uh, add you as a friend on there as well. And uh, yeah, if you want to help to support the show, you can do that in a number of different ways. Get your name in the end credits. So if you go to kevsrobots.com slash coffee, you can buy me a physical coffee. I love coffee. I've got some nice Romanian coffee, I believe, in the, uh, the coffee machine uh, that Alex brought back from Romania recently. Uh, you can do a super thanks as well. If you're watching this on the live stream, you can do a super chat. Let me make sure we've got our widgets switched on for that as well. Uh, there we go. I think one of these pops up and says... Uh, widget not found doesn't it is it that one? Oh, there we go let's switch that on yeah i think one of the <laughs> love that 
404 not found. Uh, I think that's the uh, stream elements one. I don't know why they've decided to stop that working. Their loss. Um, oh no, it's buy me a coffee, I think, is the one that doesn't work on there. Anyway, you can do a super chat. You can do a super thanks. I think the super thanks button is underneath the main player in YouTube. And you can also join the YouTube membership program just by clicking the join button underneath this uh, this window if you're watching this back on replay. Okay, let's go to the... Uh, Think of the last slide there which is our supporters of course so let's say a big thank you to all our supporters so we have uh, mary louise mayor who uh, uh, bought me a coffee recently thank you for that i think you bought a couple of coffees actually we've got paul hallam who also bought a coffee recently eric hart steve gale and somebody wanted to remain nameless also bought coffees for me recently on buymeacoffee.com uh, there's jeff johnson adam Sargent, who's a haunted howarth uh, alex and uh, jenny were in howarth today at the steampunk festival uh, I don't think they saw Adam anywhere there, but um, yeah, check out Adam's Haunted Howarth if you've not done any of his tours. Uh, definitely worth a go. We've got Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, Tom, Shemi, Steve Phillips, uh, as well as members. Thank you to all of those members there. And on the YouTube, we have uh, Chris, we've got Cassie, we've got Dale, we've got Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates, Bill Hoy, Oxfad39, Javi Gold, Hans from Cheerlights, Michael, and of course, Tom as well. So thank you all for supporting the show. And if you want to get your name in the credits, you can also just go to kevinroberts.com slash credits. I've got shortcuts for everything on here as well uh, and i think that's everything i've got for you today on the uh on the stream so, so this, this is the point of the video if you're watching this on replay i'll say thank you so much for watching and i shall see you next time